How do we use macros in Racket? I will give you now a few examples to highlight and showcase how do you use macros in Racket. So how to define them and then use them. So the simplest example is revisiting the add macro that we wrote in C and now we're showing it how to run it in Racket. So instead of define, now you write define minus syntax rule and then you write the name of your macro and you can add param parameters as you would for a function. But note that when you run this macro, so let's say here, what you're doing is really replacing whatever parameters you gave by this expression, in this case, the addition of the two parameters. So if I were to copy paste the example and I run it, I would get what you would expect. So I would add one and two, that would be three. So three times nine, I would get something like two and then three, right? Which is trivially equal, and that's why the test passes. So this is how you would uh, define a macro. You use the define syntax rule, and then name of macro and parameters of the macro. So now let's write something a bit more interesting. Um, so we create a macro for square root, and I want to highlight the fact that a, rec um, a macro is just generating code. So if you have side effects, you have to be careful with how you expand the code that is given. So what, it, what I'm trying to say here is that, uh, let me write the example. What I'm trying to say here is that the expression is not unlike a function application where we evaluate the values from left to right. When you have a macro, you are not evaluating anything. You're simply generating code. So when I pass two times three to square root, to, squ to the square, what will happen is that square will be replaced by, because I have x, what is x? x is going to be this whole expression. So the whole expression will appear twice, which is effectively computing uh, six two times, right? We're evaluating this twice, whether, rather if we were to um, call a function, the value would be valued once. And then, you know, when you are inside the function square, square, you would get a value. So then you would not be computing two times three twice. You would just be computing um, six multiplied by six. So as you can see, the test passes. So this is doing what you would expect. So if I do square root of three, I get nine, right? Am I not running this? Six, let me see. Okay, I didn't save it. So now I ran this, uh, I squared three and I got nine. But notice that if I do something a bit different, which has a side effect, so let's observe the side effect. I run F, and F just does a display. It prints out uh, exclamation mark, and then calls square roots. So now let's see what happens. I'm going to comment this out, and instead I'm going to do square root of F. So what do you think is going to happen? Try to answer the question uh, by yourself. Please pause the video and try to figure out what would happen if you call if SQR were a function, what would the output be? And given that it is a macro and that it's simply replacing the code, what do you think would be the output of this? Try to answer that by yourself. Pause the video and then resume. Okay, I hope you pause the video. So if I call this, what's going to happen is I'm going to get Let's see. What I'm expecting to happen is, let me find and replace. So I have F here, right? But because square is defined with just repeating X twice, what I'm going to have is F and F, right? So what I'm going to see in my screen is two exclamation points and then the number uh, nine. 
So let's see if that is what happens. See? The two side effects of running, of, of calling F twice, right? Because SQR is just expense F twice, right? That's what the macro is saying here. So with this, we need to be very careful. If the parameter is being evaluated, if you, if you use it twice, it's going to be evaluated twice, right? So that is the problem. So how do we prevent that? Well, there's one way of preventing it is, as we've learned, we just create a, a lambda and we pass that value. So let's try to do that. So if I wanted to fix this, I could write instead of this square, I would write this one. Right? So what is the left, this first part? I'm just defining a lambda, an anonymous function that has a new x, right? And I pass the expression x to it, right? So now I need to be careful that x needs to be an expression, right? Something that I can evaluate. And then I will just pass that something to a function call. The function is always being created and it's this lambda. So now if I call it again, I only have one exclamation mark which means the function f was only computed once. Another way to write this is to, to write new x, uh, sorry, to write a let expression, which we haven't learned, but it's basically a way to declare an internal variable. So what if we, what if we were to, instead of doing this, maybe we could write, let's see what happens if we write it this way. So instead of writing SQR, maybe what I wanted to do is I wanted to do define um, Y and I do X. Okay, and then what I do is Y, Y. Let's see how does racket behave. What do you think is going to happen? Let's see. So if I run it again, oof, I get, I get too many forms error, which means you cannot sequence these two operations. So it doesn't behave exactly like a function, right? In a function, this were a function, right? If I were to write that like this, this would be valid code. But macros, they behave a bit differently. So you have to be careful. You have to return just a single expression, right? So this wouldn't work. Okay, just to highlight that defines and, and define syntax rule, they're not exactly the same. There are some constraints in, in using define syntax rule. So we saw two ways of actually caching the value, uh, and they are either by using a lambda or by using a let, and actually let expense to the lambda. So there you go. <clears throat> so why would you want to control evaluation? Well, I just gave you one example, right? Let's say your parameter has a side effect. If you want it to just evaluate once, then you want to control evaluation. So in this example that I just gave you, you really want to be able to control evaluation somehow. Um, another use case is, what if you're defining a conditional or anything that behaves like a conditional? Um, you can do that using macros. So macros are a way to define um, ifs, so here is a way to define an if. You say if, you give it a condition, the then branch and the else branch, and you write it like this. And what you do is you can encode it with ors and ends. And I leave as an exercise for, for you to figure out why this works. Uh, and then I could write two test cases that are saying, if this is true, then I will evaluate one. If this is false, I'm going to evaluate two, right? And to showcase that uh, the if is correct, I just do a division by zero, which would trigger an error if it were uh, incorrectly implemented. So let me just run this for you. So if I run this code, get an exception because I haven't defined this. Okay. And now, as you can see, the tests have passed, so this worked. And now to show, to 
prove to you that this is in fact um, correctly defined. Now I'm going to define a function, right? And as you and as I showed you in class, if I try to define an if with a function declaration, it wouldn't work because it will evaluate both branches. So as you can see here, I get a division by zero, right? I get uh, this code crashes uh, because it evaluates uh, this division by zero. So this is just to explain that macros can be used to control the evaluation order uh, without encodings like we did with lambdas before and thunks and or promises. Um, yeah, and that's another example. So another thing you can do is let's say you want to encode somehow assert. We've been using the check equals, but you could also write the following code. You write an assert, and if this condition fails, then you would like to um, show what was the condition that failed. So one very nice way of doing this is if you have, since we have defined the, the if already, what we can do is we try to evaluate x, right? And if we are able to evaluate it, we return void, so we don't do anything. But if it fails, we throw an exception, right? But as you know, if we were to just return the runtime value, what would happen is we, we just get the actual value. We don't know what was the expression and why it, nor why it failed. So let's see the difference between implementing an assert as a function or an assert as a macro and why this is important. So if I try to run it like this, um, I get that uh, the condition failed, right? So uh, I can try to remove this quote and I just get the value. So if I want to say, why, why did this fail, right? If I want to write an assert, I want to know why that assertion failed. So one thing I could do is, well, I can just paste the code X here so that I can know why it failed. But what you will see is that it will also re always return false, right? Because if this evaluates, if you pass it here, um, the if is going to evaluate, um, the x is going to be evaluated once it's called, which means when, it's, when it reaches this if, this is always going to be either true or false. So if the if passes, um, you return nothing, right? But if it fails, that means that x has to be false. So uh, if you implement this as a function, you have no way of knowing what x is. So what you would like to be able to do is delay the evaluation. And that's what we do in the second line of code. With the macro, what we can do is x, again, is just an expression. So we're just copy pasting that expression and putting it inside an if. And then what we're doing is we're put, putting that expression inside a quote. And as you've learned, quote, what it does is it prints out the code. So because x is code, if I quote it, it's going to show up as code. So let's see what happens if I run it again. Isn't it nice? Now we have an error that is showing exactly what was the code that failed. And we see that end f w was evaluated to false. That's what we know because the, the condition failed, right? So actually with, with, the, um, with the macro thing, we were able to do two things, not just use if before, but also we are able to copy the code. And with the aid of quote, we are able even to print out the code that was copied, which I think is really cool. So next, what we could do is we can implement uh, a local binding. So this is the example I showed you before in a previous slide. Let's say you want to define a constructor that assigns x to v. Sorry, evaluates v, assigns it to x, and then passes it to e. That is well known as the let constructor. And you can very easily define it using a macro. So what you do is you just encode a function declaration. And note how I'm using the x, where x is a formal parameter that I'm using as a parameter of my lambda. So, I, so the macro is very powerful, right? I can actually uh, use it to construct lambdas, very similar to what you do in your interpreter when you are, um, you know, for instance, when you, you wrote substitution where you do code rewriting. But here you actually write actual code, so it can be a bit confusing. So let me comment this out so that the code is evaluated. And you'll see that the test passes, so this actually does what it should be doing. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to talk a bit about more advanced 
uh, technique of macros, which is adding types to macros so that you can have a bit better error reporting. 